We really like to hear your reactions and comments throughout our event today. I'm already seeing folks putting their names and where they're calling in from in the chat. Thank you. So please add those in the chat throughout the event. If you have questions for our panelists or our staff, please put those in the Q&A box so we can track them. If we don't have time to get to all of your questions, we'll follow up afterwards. Next slide, please. As we get into today's conversation, we'd love to hear from you also in the chat. What does bold on early educator compensation mean to you? Next slide, please. As folks are putting their answers in the chat, I'll share some responses from participants in our bold on compensation learning community. We started this project back in January, and you'll be hearing more about it momentarily. We asked participants why they were joining and what bold on compensation meant to them. One person said, I'm interested in big, bold change for the early childhood workforce. I would like to learn more about how that could look in our state and our advocacy. Next slide, please. Another participant shared, I had to leave the classroom because of compensation. I dream of a day no other teacher has to do that. Next slide, please. Bold on compensation to this person means coming up with innovative new approaches to funding that have the potential to support adequate compensation for the entire field, not just some sectors. And another person said coming up with new ways to fund our educators. So you can hear that this group was really committed to learning and to action on compensation that is bold and inclusive across the entire workforce. There's also the motivation to be creative and think outside the box to find solutions and move resources towards better compensation for early educators. Next slide, please. Thank you to everyone who shared in the chat. We really love learning about what brings you here today. So moving along, here's today's agenda. First, we'll hear opening remarks. Then our panel of learning community participants will share stories from their own work on early educator compensation and finally, we'll have a discussion amongst the panelists facilitated by Dr. Caitlin McLean with opportunities to take questions from the audience from the Q&A box. Next slide, please. So with that, it's my privilege to introduce our opening speakers for today, Dr. Leah Austin and Wendy chun -Hoon. Dr. Leah Austin is the Executive Director of the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment at the University of California, Berkeley. She leads the center's agenda aimed at realizing a publicly funded early care and education system that secures racial, gender, and economic justice for the women whose labor is the linchpin of its services. She is an expert on the US ECE system and its workforce and has extensive expertise in the areas of compensation, preparation, working conditions, and racial equity. Leah, thanks for being here. Wendy Chun Hoon was appointed by President Biden as the 20th Director of the Women's Bureau in the U.S. Department of Labor. For the past 10 years, Wendy has led Family Values at Work, a national network of grassroots coalitions that have won more than 60 new paid leave policies, bringing new rights to millions of workers and their loved ones, as well as working on access to child care, fair wages, and employment conditions for workers. Recognizing the ways in which her own family would be excluded from new policies for paid time to care, Wendy spearheaded the development of the Family Justice Network, building cross-movement organizing among pay leave advocates. Wendy is skilled at coalition building, bridging strategy across grassroots community organizing, and public sector policymaking at state and national levels. Thank you so much, Wendy and Leah, for starting us off today. Leah, we'll start with you. Great. Thank you, Annie. Um, I'm so appreciative to be joined by this amazing group of women who are leading on ECE compensation, including our guests and panelists and our CSCC, CSCCE staff members. And I'm loving seeing the comments um, coming in the chat, so keep those going too throughout, uh, throughout our conversation today. You know, worthy wage activists have long been advocating for better compensation. And at CSCCE, it's been part of our mission to realize ECE jobs as good, stable jobs with professional wages and accompanying benefits. But it hasn't always been the case that we could talk about compensation, being bold on compensation without being met with resistance. Being referred to as the compensation people, as we often are, was not always meant as a good thing uh, when we came in, into a room. Um, we always appreciate it, but that we knew that's not always, uh, wasn't always what people meant. But through a series of events over the last, maybe better part of a decade, including seminal reports, worthy work, still on movable wages, 
and transforming the workforce, our changing culture and activism around income inequality in this country, along with policy leadership on ECE, we have broken through some of layers of resistance. And in fact, we can now organize a body of work around being bold on compensation and have people eager to be involved and part of the work and part of the conversation. Many states are today doing what they can to use American Rescue Plan dollars, for example, and other COVID relief dollars to get pay and benefits directly to the ECU workforce with an eye towards how they can carry this over into post pandemic times. There is certainly so much to do. There's a lot more work to do to realize good ECE jobs, but the response to the pandemic in particular has provided the latitude and leverage for states to do something more and to do something different than they have before with public funding. From my vantage point, I see momentum and opportunities for us to really break past poverty, poverty level wages that have characterized this work with strategies and resources to raise compensation and to intentionally disrupt the disparities and wage gaps that we know are endemic to this sector. Especially for example, for black women and for infant and toddler educators who are consistently and systematically paid less than their peers for equal work in the sector. Um, nonetheless, despite my optimism about breaking through um, and making progress, I do recognize that for many, the challenges can seem really just too big and really complex. Um, I know here at the center, when we often are engaged with folks talking about this and talking about change, we're met with the request to like, well, show us, like show us who's doing this because it just feels like, you know, our individual context or what's happening in our state or just the limitations on, you know, this, that, and the other can just feel like it's too much. So like, where are people actually doing this? And so that really inspired us to start the Bold on Early Educator Compensation Learning Community, which kicked off this past January. We found states and state leaders that are actively working to do more and to do things differently to raise compensation, to expand who public dollars are reaching and to examine and address inequities in their systems. The learning community has provided a space for leaders to gather, to learn, to share, to problem solve and think creatively about actual compensation strategies that they're trying and grappling with and trying to advance in their states. And importantly, we're documenting and sharing what we're learning. Um, today is one of those opportunities to hear directly from some of the leaders themselves about their journey toward better wages and benefits for early educators. Um, I think Caitlin's going to provide a little bit more context about the learning community specifically in just a few minutes, but you can also always read about it uh, more in depth on our website and we post updates there as well. Um, but I'm excited now at this point to pass it over to Wendy Chen Hoon for her opening remarks. And Wendy, um, thank you again so much for joining us uh, and collaborating with us to host this webinar. Thank you, Leah, um, and to your whole team, uh, the Berkeley Center for the Study of Child Care Employment, for inviting me to join you from the United States Department of Labor and the Women's Bureau. Um, for those of you who don't know the Women's Bureau yet, we, for a, a hundred years now, um, it has really been our mission to push for better jobs and wages and benefits for working women. And so improving pay and working conditions in key female dominated sectors like the childcare sector is necessarily a key priority for us and for the entire Biden-Harris administration. So um, Leah, you know, was just listening to what you were sharing at the top and you're right, we did not need the pandemic to show us how threadbare our care infrastructure is, but it definitely has been a catalyst for states and cities to be bold on reform. Um, Access to childcare is a necessary support for women who want to enter and remain in the paid workforce, but you're right again, too often the conversation stops there. And so we've got to see childcare workforce as workers and families themselves and advocating for a robust care infrastructure can't solely be about ensuring that women have the opportunity to work, right? But it's also about ensuring that the women who do this work have the opportunity to thrive. Um, when we talk about an inclusive economic recovery and women's advancement in the workforce, we've got to see supporting and strengthening childcare workforce as an integral part of these conversations. And so that's what we hope um, we can help do uh, from the Women's Bureau and from the Department of Labor. We, I, my team and I just spent the last several days with 
more than 3,000 women who are working in the construction trades across the country. These are the folks who are rebuilding America's roads and bridges. And you know, in deep conversation about how we're going to get more women access to training and sustaining careers and some of these good paying infrastructure funded jobs that are coming, like EV charging stations and building the semiconductors and wind energy. And I have to say one of the loudest, most resounding demands across all of these 3000 women there was the need for affordable and accessible and non standard hour childcare and to a T. Every single one of these tradeswomen understand the link between their family's economic security and the economic security of the workers who are caring for their kids. So that is a huge, huge opportunity for cross-movement alignment and also for organizing. Um, a, a lot of what the Women's Bureau keeps an eye on is the data coming out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics and really how are women and women of color faring. Uh, so I think we all know and very much feel we are still missing one in 10 child day daycare workers uh, in our care workforce. Uh, child care workers receive among the lowest wages of any occupation in the country. They're over twice as likely to live below poverty compared to women, uh, workers in other sectors. More than 15% of child care workers live below the poverty line in 41 states. That, that is a shame on all of us. Um, supporting early care education, educators is frankly a matter of racial and gender justice. Unpaid, underpaid work done by women and particularly women of color, absolutely rooted in our country's history of slavery. So this is what we're here to disrupt. Um, in this moment, we've got the opportunity to address some of the deep and longstanding inequities that continue to hold back women, people of color, working families. And so a lot of what we have been doing in this first year and a half of the Biden administration has been focused on the rescue dollars that went into child care stabilization and recovery. Um, we've been collaborating with and hosting conversations with our colleagues at Health and Human Services and the Treasury Department and Commerce to really uplift innovative models that are being implemented at the state and local levels that are really laying that groundwork for future reform. Uh, in September, we through a partnership that we had with Cornell's Worker Institute, we convened hundreds of folks that are really leading this work uh, across the country at the Department of Labor, at our Equity and Focus Summit, to talk about what they have learned, how to sustain and scale this work. And so we are eager to keep learning from all of you in conversations like today. Um, I'll end by saying we, we all know we need additional significant investments to really support sustainable long term solutions in the care uh, industry. And so we remain committed to ensuring that child care workers are compensated fairly, earning a good living uh, for the critical work that they do to support our families and our economy. So thanks so much for having me. Really eager to learn with you today. Um, and Caitlin, handing it off to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wendy and Leah, for your inspiring remarks, and welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Caitlin McLean, Director of Multi-State and International Programs here at the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment, and I am the Project Director of our Bold on Early Educator Compensation Learning Community. Before we introduce our panelists, I want to say a few words about who our learning community is and our purpose. Our learning community brings together a group of 20 leaders, advocates, government agency representatives, and legislators from seven states, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Mexico, North Carolina, Washington, Wisconsin, and Vermont, all with the purpose of building understanding and capacity to implement policies that increase compensation, including wages and benefits, or that otherwise provide financial relief for the early care and education workforce. Our learning community has been gathering throughout the year and will conclude this month. And you can find a complete list of participants and convening topics on our website, which we'll be sharing with you all. In addition to our state participants, we've been lucky to have two terrific co-facilitators, Ngazi Lowell and Anna Lovejoy, as well as many expert speakers who have shared their wisdom with us over the past year. And none of this would be possible without generous funding from the Foundation for Child Development. So to any of you in the audience today, thank you.
Next slide, please, Claudia. As a field, we face a unique opportunity to finally make meaningful progress on compensation for the early educator workforce. In the wake of the pandemic and worsening workforce shortage, leaders at the federal and state levels are calling for solutions with a growing sense of urgency. Our learning community seizes on this opportunity to learn from state leaders who have already seen some success. The learning community provides peer learning space for states to address hurdles in real time, as well as an understanding of possible models and lessons learned. As state leaders develop strategies using short-term funds, the learning community also provides opportunities to reflect on how to build on what has been achieved so far and how to sustain the momentum needed for transformative longer term change. And one of the strongest themes that has emerged from our learning community is that as individuals, we don't know everything, but together we know a lot. Next slide, please, Claudia. Today we'll hear from leaders in three states from our learning community who will share their stories about how to make change for early educator compensation. I'm proud to introduce Kareen Hendrickson from Wisconsin. Kareen has owned and operated Kareen Little Explorers Family Child Care Center in New Glarus, Wisconsin since 2007. She holds a BS in elementary education, pre-K through six. In 2020, she co-founded Wisconsin Early Childhood Action Needed and currently serves on the Wisconsin Main Street Alliance leadership team. She has been the secretary for the Greene County Child Care Network since 2012 and was elected in 2020 to the local school board. In addition to all of these roles, she is a wife and mom to two boys aged 13 and 15. And she's written an inspiring blog on being an educator advocate that we'll add to the chat for you to check out. We'll also hear from Gab Gabriella Quintana from Washington State. Gabriella is a senior policy associate at the Economic Opportunity Institute. She has been with EOI for 10 years, working on paid leave issues, and more recently, working to address early learning and childcare policy. Prior to joining EOI, Gabriella managed her own consulting business where she worked on social and racial justice issues. Gabriella lives in Tukwila, Washington with her husband and 11 year old son who was a blow up dinosaur for Halloween. Very awesome. Also joining us is Ariel Ford from North Carolina. Ariel has over 20 years of experience working across the field of early childhood education. She is passionate about developing early childhood programs, policies, and systems that make a difference in the lives of children, families, and early educators. In North Carolina, Ariel worked as an early educator, a center director, a technical assistant, and as a CCRNR director in the Buncombe Partnership for Children and is now the Director for the Division of Child Development and Early Education. Welcome to each of you, and now I'll turn it over to Kareen to share her story as an educator advocate in Wisconsin. Thank you, Caitlin, for that introduction. So I'm Kareen, and I have been advocating with Brooke Skid Skidmore, which is, who is a group center colleague for a few years, um, including working with our state senator to present a no small matter screening at the Capitol to interested bipartisan lawmakers. We had started talking about how to leverage this vast network of parents, community members, and other childcare business owners and professionals that we had amassed. When in March of 2020, COVID hit, and the schools were closing, and we were trying to figure out how to navigate this pandemic, not knowing how the children would be affected, if we could stay healthy, or if we even wanted to expose our families, especially as a family child care provider, people are coming into my home. And then 5 p.m. on Sunday night, those of us who are subscribed to the listserv for the Department of Children and Families found an email asking us to stay open because otherwise parents couldn't get to work. We were deemed essential, but this left us feeling very expendable. We had zero pr protective equipment. We had little access to food or cleaning supplies, and we decided the time was right to launch our Wisconsin Early Childhood Action Needed. We can because we needed to be seen as professionals and worthy of being protected like the other educators, especially since we don't have health insurance or paid time off. And well, because child care is everyone's business, that we matter and that we can and should empower each other. So we launched a Facebook page and did informal polls with, oh, next, 
within our networks to see what our priorities would be should be. Besides protection from teacher um, from COVID, teacher wages were number one because how can you expect early childhood educators to create meaningful relationships and meet the needs of multiple young children when their low wages and lack of health care means that they can't even meet their own needs? So we did um, how we can organize our support. So we did online Zoom trainings on how to share your story. Our state Senator Urbanbach and Assembly Rep Pope presented on the budget process to all interested people. We met with lots of groups of representatives and committees and did practice advocacy sessions for all of our members to prepare to participate in those budget hearings, talk with reps and invite them into our programs if we um, felt comfortable enough to do so. We then created um, templates by, um, we created templates by supporter type so that people would be able to share their own stories in a way that was unified and still have that same sort of ask. And then we were, um, we're able to send those off to the elected officials asking that teacher wages be included in the budget because in 2020 it was a budget year in Wisconsin. And so then we had some templates for child care business owners to talk with parents about why care is so expensive, yet wages are so low. But be really honest about that because people do the math of the rates and assume it's all for it's all profit. But those of us in the field understand that the profit margin is so low because we can only people can only afford to pay us so much and food. Um, property taxes, liability insurance, all of those things add up. Um, you can find these resources also at our um, website, wecanaction.com. We did create a website as well. Um, next slide, please. So this which led to one of our biggest successes, and that was when the budget ask came around for a line item specifically for child care to be added. We, um, because currently in Wisconsin, we just put the minimum required for those federal funds. We, as a, a group of we can found that the main statewide advocacy group no, did not have a provision for wages to be specifically required in that. And we as a field pushed back on those stakeholder meetings saying that 50% needed to be required for wages specifically because the teachers in the classrooms didn't trust that the money would get to them and family child care receiving the funding specifically marked for wages would be more likely to use it as their own wages and also maybe to purchase health insurance or retirement. So in Wisconsin, we have a joint finance committee that then decides what goes into the final budget. Our joint finance committee denied that budget request. So then when the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan money came through, the stabilization grant program, we also called it child care accounts. We then got that to go forward into that and was submitted and improved by the JFC about seven months later. So as we can, we did a lot of different things together, and we decided that there's some great things that other people can use to do this in their own states and in their own areas. And these tips are for all early educators, but then also for others who want to advocate for investments in child care. So the tips are teach others about that policy process, really understand what and how you get things into the budget, how you get appropriations, how you create legislation, who you need to talk to, and get lots of different stakeholders involved in that process. Um, also, when you cultivate those relationships with the legislators, they will actually then reach out to you to talk about those policies, the funding, the needs, and let you know what is happening that might benefit you. So a couple examples are that Brooke and I helped write legislation that was introduced this last February to expand funding for children with special needs to include all children with significant special needs, not just those who are on subsidy. Um, however, it did stall out in um, February because uh, the session in Wisconsin ended for the year. Um, and, but we have talked with the people who had co-signed onto it, and then our elected officials are actually retiring. So we are talking to the ones who are running to take their place. And we have had um, two of the rep, two of them have said that yes, indeed, they will then reintroduce the same legislation in the next um, session. And then also another example is during COVID pandemic when the Paycheck Protection Program was going around, my congressional. Um, assembly rep, Mark Pocan, his office actually reached out to me, told me about the Paycheck Protection Program, wanted to make sure that I knew how to access it, and were asking me if I knew about other people and that they could reach out to to kind of help with, navigate that. And in the second round, they changed the rules so that it wasn't based off of your profit, it was based off of what um, your income completely was. Um, and so that those of us as sole proprietors would actually be eligible that weren't eligible before or be able to get a little bit more. So when you make those and cultivate those relationships, your legislators will actually reach out to you and talk to you because they see you as expert. They can't understand everything about everything. So then they look for people that they know they can talk to that will have an idea of what is happening. 
You want to go with other supporters and investment in that child care. So other parents, other business owners, other state and regional professional organizations, community groups, community members with that unified ask. Make sure that you have one ask and that everybody agrees to that one ask. Um, you might have to, you know, have a few conversations to talk about, you know, different things that you can work on after or, you know, in tandem, but you want to have that one unified ask so that whenever, wherever they're going, they're hearing that from you, that this is the ask. And for us, that ask was wages, because at the end of the day, if we're not paid what we need to be paid, we can't stay. And then it just continues the, you know, the spiral downward. And share that your personal stories, be honest about those stories and make sure you tell them, this is really difficult for me to tell you because I'm only making $10 an hour at the end of the day, but I know you're paying me $12,000, but this is why, and this is why we need to have public investment, and this is why we need to make partnerships and really help people understand, even if they don't have kids, that their colleagues have kids, and that affects their ability to come into work and be present and you know fully immersed in their work. Um, also, at the end, Success does definitely make it easier, but really listen to those reasons that they're pushing back on you as to why they can't or don't want to, and then use those it, that information to really refine that message um, to then go back and support that unified ask with different um, things. And that is um, all I had to say. So thank you very much, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Kareem. And now, Gabriella, we will turn it over to you to, your, to share your story. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm Gabriela from the Economic Opportunity Institute. Uh, the Economic Opportunity Institute's been uh, around Seattle for over 20 years, and we're a public policy advocacy organization working on economic security um, issues for families here in Washington, and clearly uh, child care uh, and compensation for child care teachers is um, a key issue that we work on. Uh, in 2021, um, our state legislature passed a really large policy called a Fair Start for Kids, one of the largest investments in Washington state. Uh, and sadly, only tiny, tiny portion of the 336 million that uh, was saved or that was put into that project, um, only a tiny, tiny amount went to child care compensation. Uh, during that summer, after the session started or ended, uh, we um, we hired an intern to help us organize the child care um, providers. Uh, in this picture, you see Angie um, Angie Maxi, who is the owner of Tiny Tots Development Center um, in South Seattle here. Um, and I'll talk about the rest of the folks. But in that summer, Angie and many about another forty nine of her. Um, other providers in the city of Seattle had already begun to organize. Next slide, please. Um, there were about 50 providers that were self-organizing and they called themselves the, the Seattle Child Care uh, Business Coalition. Um, and at the same time, we were also doing some outreach to them and did one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews and meetings with them where we learned that um, healthcare and child care compensation were at the top of their mind. Um, as something that they wanted to fix and as the troubles that they were um, facing. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, at the same time, the Seattle City Council was really beginning its budgeting process and we knew that we, this was our opportunity to come um, ask for some monies to help uh, providers um, give their staff some compensation, something that they could not do through the legislative process. Um, and so we began to organize them. Uh, we knew that we wanted to ask for an amount for each teacher um, and staff that was a meaningful amount. We knew that um, there, were, there was a lot of competition out there. We weren't going to be the only ones asking for some of the federal funds to come to us. Everybody had a need. So we really needed to organize um, uh, fast and quick. Um, a meaningful amount really uh, for some folks it meant at least a thousand dollars per teacher. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so in the end, after organizing all the childcare providers and other folks uh, where we came together and, and uh, got stories and, um, you know, um, 
uh, got data to show them the need and really had the providers come tell, we were able to get $3 million from the city of Seattle, specifically for child care compensation. compensation. And um, those that were eligible were um, teachers and staff that worked um, in a licensed child care center or home that was recognized by the state. So that was about 3,500 staff and each got about $835. And it didn't, um, uh, it was regardless of their part-time or full-time status. Um, the goal was to reach all child care staff who worked on site um, at this licensed um, child care centers during the pandemic. Um, and there were about 537 sites that uh, participated, which uh, serve about 20,000 kids in Seattle. Um, I'm talking really fast and I'm forgetting some things probably. Um, yeah, I think I can end there. Um, and I can, if, if we can go back to that first slide with the pictures, I can see. The... Thank you. So um, Jenny Durkin is on the far left. She was the mayor at the time. Um, she did not run for re-election. She's no longer here. In the center um, right is uh, council member Teresa Mosqueda who really sponsored our request. And at the far, far left or far, far right is our um, then executive director who retired uh, this uh, that, that following June. Um, but this was the sort of the team that really kind of made things happen and, and really helped organize everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella. And now, Ariel, over to you to tell us about North Carolina. Great. Hey, everybody, Ariel Ford with North Carolina. Um, I will start by saying, I think I was the participant that had the quote about, um, I had to stop being a teacher because of compensation. And so that is how I got into policy is because um, I loved being a two-year-old teacher. It is to date the favorite job I've ever had in my whole entire life. Um, and I always had to have my full job as a teacher, my full-time job as a teacher, a part-time job, and almost always a side hustle on top of it. And I was still putting credit card, you know, gas or groceries on the credit card before payday. So this is not just academic for me or a professional inquiry. It is, um, a lived experience. So, um, I'm born and raised in North Carolina, came up through the early childhood system in the state, took advantage of childcare wages. And I have a whole story about that and how that has, that helped me stay in the field. Next slide. Um, but I started in this role as division leader for early child, uh, the division of, um, division of child development and early education. Good Lord. What do I work, uh, in 2020. And when in 2021, we had the opportunity to work on the ARPA operational grants, the first thing that we knew we needed to do was to go to our community and get input. And so we went to child care providers and teachers. We heard from over 1,200 people across the state about how we needed to invest these funds. And by and large, the two categories that came up were compensation and operational supports because people had taken out a lot of debt to stay open through the pandemic. And this is some of the feedback that we got um, through some of our initial ARPA invest or our initial COVID investments. Next slide. Um, there should be like three more slides. There are no other slides. There are no other slides. Okay, so we came up with a plan um, that uh, that focused on the, those two components I talked to you about. There was one for compensation, one for fixed cost and family grants. Within compensation, there were two options. So people could choose to provide bonuses only, or they could increase base pay and or benefits. So if they did bonuses only, there was a lower amount that was static per person, regardless of the QRIS scoring of the program, education of the teacher, whatever. Programs could come up with their own scale for their bonuses, but we gave one static amount. Base pay and benefits, if you chose that option, that was based on um, a couple of factors. So we took the 2019 um, workforce study, 
and took the average rates of pay by education level. So that was a starting point. We used the model salary scale. So North Carolina and a consortium of, of organizations and people worked together to come up with a model salary scale loosely based on pay parity with K-12. And so what we wanted to index was people to move from that initial, the amount that, that teachers were making in 2019 and provide enough funding for people to be able to move their teachers up to parity-ish and or give benefits. So that's how we came up the, with the formula for base pay, the base pay and benefits option in the, in the compensation option. Another thing to think about in, in this is that we knew that there would be a giant cliff. We're all getting ready for this giant cliff with ARPA. And so we wanted to taper off, especially those operational supports. We knew that there would be more kids coming into the system. We um, knew that people would be able to pay off that bad day, debt early. And so those operational components would be less and less over time, but that compensation doesn't really change. We knew you would continue to need compensation supports at a high level through the entirety of our recovery efforts. So we have a tapering process for, for the operational supports and a, and a flat process for compensation. Compensation having two options, whether you do a bonus or you decide I'm gonna give people a $2 hour raise or I'm gonna provide them health insurance. And across the state, we have people making really smart decisions for their own businesses. So fast forward to, I think these are August numbers for 2022. We have been able to support 4,247 childcare centers and homes. You can see the breakdown. We have been able to give out almost $200 million for compensation. And we have spent a total of $655 million total, $655 million out of the $805 that we were given for, for operational grants. I don't know if y'all will remember March of 2021 when a little thing called vaccines came out and we all thought the world was going to get better in a couple months. It was going to be wonderful and life would return to normal and that has not necessarily happened. So our, our workforce continues to be um, a challenge for us to, to hire back teachers. We are about a 3% deficit from where we started pre-pandemic. That's better than the national average, but still not, it's not like we had too many teachers beforehand. Um, and so what we've been able to do is repurpose some funds that we were going to use for other pipeline initiatives to build the pipeline to use to extend the compensation portion of these grants for another three quarters. These are quarterly payments. So we'll be able to extend these funds through the end of calendar year 2023. At that point, uh, we don't have any more money right now. So we are working in partnership with the feds, with our state, with um, other advocates across the state to really make sure that compensation is a key initiative as we move into our, our long session budget planning. We know that our field needs the money. We need to continue to support teachers. Um, and there's just, there's no way to shortcut pay. There's, there's, this is, this is an industry that relies on humans to support babies' lives. And so it's important that we, we keep that in front and center. I'm really proud that we've been able to, to do this. It, while it is not permanent money, it would have made the world of difference to me as a teacher to know that somebody cared enough to put money into, to pour money into me and my colleagues um, that matters. And so I hope this has been a small part of being able to keep other teachers in the classroom when I couldn't. And um, I think that is the, the highs and lows of, of my efforts. North Carolina has some other compensation efforts like childcare wages and um, childcare awards, which are education-based salary supplements outside of, uh, out, uh, directly to teachers. But this has been a huge initiative for us. So thank you for the opportunity to learn alongside all of you amazing people doing this work. Thank you so much, Ariel, Gabriella, and Kareem for sharing your captivating stories with all of us. For those of you in the audience, keep your questions coming. We have a ton. <laughs> I know we won't get to all of them today, but, but please do keep sending them to us in the Q&A because we're gonna do our best to follow up 
afterward with any questions that we can't get to. So now we're gonna to turn to a discussion with our panelists. And Kareem, I wanna start with you with a question that came up from our audience about, I think expressing some amazement really <laughs> about all of the different roles that you fill so incredibly. Um, given you know, all the responsibilities that you have running your own childcare center, in addition to you know, taking care of your family and just all of the things that you do as a person. So could you share with the audience, you know, what, what has been helpful for you and to allow you to take on all these different roles, especially as an educator advocate and what supports you know, either are or could be in place to help you and other educator advocates like you? So thank you for the question. And um, I just wanted to say that, yes, it is hard and it is a lot. Um, there are days where I'm exhausted, but all of the successes that we have had have really helped then motivate me to continue. And I am getting compensated for some of these things now when two years ago, I definitely wasn't. Um, it also helps to have my colleague, Brooke, because between the two of us, we keep each other going. Um, when one of us is feeling frustrated, the other one can kind of step up. But part of what we advocated for in that budget ask, sorry, I didn't make it real clear, was that 50% of the money from the um, American Rescue Plan had to go to the wages for the teachers. That actually has allowed me to hire somebody as a substitute so that I can leave my program and she's very part-time she's somebody who's going to college to be you know for getting her master's so and she's a parent of a child that I have here in my program so for COVID and things like that it helped so it was it helped out a lot but I could also pay her a decent wage and she's getting a bonus because of the child care counts teacher payment so she's making around twenty dollars an hour which is a, a decent wage I would say um Another thing too is that we've worked with our county people. Um, so we're getting income, little bits from everywhere. So we've worked with our county people, we worked with our workforce development and we worked with our United Way. And we really had discussions with our child care network during our normal meeting times about what it is we really needed. And that kept coming back to the wages, kept coming back to professional development, kept coming back to, we don't get paid really to take classes on our own time for family child care. And so we ended up being able to do some grant writing and got a preschool development Black Grant, the very first one ever for our state from our workforce development for child care specific. And we were able to do about, we only have 29 regulated child care programs in our small county, um, but we did about 1500 hours of training. Almost everyone did three times their actual normal amount of training because they were getting paid $25 an hour to do the training. So the group center directors could afford to send them to trainings. And we did a lot of the bigger, like the social emotional foundations for early learning classes and things that were normally like a 20 to 40 hour class and get them paid. So they got $500 to take those classes. So that's really helped most of, you know, being able to do those things. And yes, it is true. It is really hard, but I also am very honest and tell people I can meet you from one to two because that is nap time. I can meet you from this time to this time because that's what works for us and works for me. And people have been so just great about listening to what I have to say. And I'm honest about why. And there are little heads that poke up a lot of times in my meetings, um, you know, and that's kind of part of it. If I can't get a sub, I just tell them straight up. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm here with the kids too. And I honestly feel like sometimes that's better for people to see that as much as it bothered me at first, because they understand that this is why I'm doing this. This is who I'm doing this for. And I am doing all of these things at the same exact time. And I'm making $7 and 42 cents an hour. And I would not have health insurance if my husband didn't have it. And I have no retirement. Um, and so I think that helps too. But honestly, it is hard work and you need to have your friends and your support and your, you know, others in your household understand that. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Kareem. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about how can we build political will around investments in the ECE workforce. In particular, someone from the audience said, how do we convince policymakers to support compensation? So Gabriella, I know you've been thinking a lot about building political will. I'd like to turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about this. Um, that is not an easy question to answer. Um, um, well, from my perspective, I think that um, it's about political will. And it's about valuing child care as a common good, like we do um, K through 12. And until we decided that is a key component, um, 
we we're not going to shift things. Um, in Washington State, we have a couple of opportunities to that we could hand to legislators to say we do have the money uh, that can fund this. And one is that we passed a capital gains tax um, in 2021, I believe that. Um, it is supposed to be slated for um, education, including early learning. It's $500 million uh, that's specifically going to that. Um, it is being fought in the courts by the, um, the people that pay the, the cap gains um, tax. And so they don't want that and they want to take it away. So it is in a sort of unstable situation. But we're also working on a um, wealth tax policy uh, that we, we, we would um, tax the wealthiest of Washingtonians, which I don't recall the number specifically. I want to say there are about 30 of them, which would bring in billions of dollars into Washington state that could be used for early learning. So I know that a lot of legislators uh, will say there is no money, there is, but advocates are working really, really hard to find the funds and it has to be a political will. Somebody the other day said, um, Legislators need to need to lean into the moral, um, into, into the moral work, and do the right thing. Um, and advocates need to organize more. I think that's my biggest message: is that um, our project, uh, the City of Seattle project, although it didn't reach full, you know, all of the state, it was a really good example of what we could do. And as a result, I think others got the, oh, we need to be doing the same thing. And so workers that are now working um, with the unhoused community were also going back and asking for one-time funds. Um, I wanted to also clarify quickly that the 835 that workers got was a one-time bonus that they got. But um, I think it's about really working with legislators and letting them know that, um, that we need to be creative and, um, and they need to step up. Caitlin, could I add a little bit to that? Absolutely. I would say in North Carolina, part of what is happening is that it is, there is a business drive for the need for childcare that um, as our state grows and as we bring in large industries, they are hearing from their employees the difficulties they're having finding childcare that's appropriate for their family so that it's high quality and meets the needs of the family. And so the advocates, and it makes sense to the legislators too, when we say our field makes $12 an hour and right across the street is, you know, a fast food restaurant that's paying $17 an hour. It makes a, it makes it very hard for us to be able to retain, to hire and retain anyone. We're not even, you know, talking about qualifications. So there's a business argument in our state that is is growing louder by the day. And I'm guessing that's probably the same in many states across the country. So it, um, that's just a place that we found some, some common ground with, with other industries. And then I'll just add a little bit more that we also need to remember that we're businesses and that we need to advocate as business owners and help the legislative body see that we are also businesses. Because I think that also gets lost a lot of the time and will help empower us as well. And another thing too, is just when you do have people come over, invite them to your program before you go to their place because they're coming into your workplace where you feel confident and you feel comfortable but then also making sure that you don't have the kids doing something that you want them to do perfectly for these when these people are coming in because that's just going to stress everybody else out um so making sure that we also when we're talking about it that we're talking about the child care business the child care industry so that it's seen as all of the different pieces in the pie that we really are Wonderful, thanks so much, each of you. So now I wanna switch gears a little bit again to a question that I know is on everyone's minds, uh, which is we've made so much progress with American Rescue Plan funds, but what happens when those funds run out? And so I want each of you to think about moving forward. What will, be, what will being bold on compensation mean to you and look like for you moving forward and coming out of this, this period. So I wanna start with you, Ariel, and I would love it if you can talk a little bit about the American Rescue Plan funding in particular. I know you mentioned that in your remarks earlier, but 
really thinking about your experience in North Carolina and how that can point us toward what we should be thinking about as we move forward. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is we have more than doubled our federal investment in our state every year of the pandemic. So for what will be four years by the end of the ARPA funds. And there's no way that you can efficiency your way out of that kind of investment. So at the end of the day, there have to be more public dollars. Families cannot pay more for child care. I'm not, I'm not saying anything kind of revolutionary. I think this is, you know, we talk about this a lot, like families can't pay more. Um, and teachers, it's not that they don't want to stay in the classroom. They want to still be teachers and they want to still have family child care homes, but they cannot afford to do it. And so there has to be a public investment at the end. I mean, there's just, I just, I don't, I don't know a way around that. I would say there's also a business responsibility that businesses have not um, seen themselves as a part of the solution in many places. And, and they are reaping the benefits of a child care system that largely is propped up on, on the backs of our teachers making low wages. So I think it is continuing to educate, it's continuing to advocate and knowing that we have to have, there just is no solution except for long-term reoccurring funds for this. So ARPA, I think of ARPA as a, a down payment on what needs to be done long-term. It has been an opportunity for people in roles like mine and for advocates to pressure test our system and show that with investments, we can make a difference and that our providers do the right thing with funds. So this idea that people would be going on cruises or buying Cadillacs is just not true. What we're seeing is that people were paying for their families who had to be out for two weeks because of COVID. They are giving raises, they are giving health insurance. So I think we have the pressure test on our system has held and now it's time to make good on the promise that's been made. And I have I actually do have confidence that we'll do something. I don't see early childhood being, it's a single point of failure for, for our economic system in our country. So if, if childcare fails, then jobs fail across the country. Thank you, Ariel. Gabriella, would you like to answer this question about what will being bold on compensation look like for you moving forward? Um, well, I can try. Um, so in Washington State, one of the groups that we heard from from our state is the um, Child Care Aware is doing a really great project where they brought in providers to really think through what a policy would look like. So it's a created by providers, sort of for providers, and the idea is to bring that to the state legislature. And they had came up with some really great ideas that won't fill the entire gap or the entire hole, but I think that can really help sustain some of those. And those include things like, um, you know, during COVID and during the, um, the grants, uh, a lot of things were like um, forgiven. So, you know, the applications for um, licenses, they're not the, the background checks. Uh, people didn't have to, but the state paid for the background checks instead of the providers themselves. And that puts, puts more money in the pockets of the providers, uh, making sure that the actual, that the workers, the teachers are eligible with themselves for the child care connections program, which is a subsidy program so that they can bring their kids to, to work and um, they themselves don't have to pay the full um, uh, tuition for their children. Uh, mainstreaming some of the, um, some of the areas in which uh uh, providers have to just submit so much paperwork and um, they have to pay this and then pay that. And like, if you mainstream that, that could really alleviate some of the stress and some of the, the constant money that goes into that. And then finally, um, uh, yeah, just providing some of the benefits. Uh, we did a little bit of work on this on making sure that um, the staff and, and providers and teachers had things like healthcare, state-based healthcare, making them eligible. So that is something that they don't have to worry about and the providers don't have to pay. All those benefits, while it's not direct cash uh, to the provider, does um, create some space for them to be able to have more flexibility in their business. Great, thank you, Gabriella. Green, any last words on what you would like to <laughs> do? I would say, 
what Ariel and Gabriella really did say, we have to invest as a public good. There is no other way around it because the system is truly imploding around us as we speak and fewer and fewer people are coming into the field and more and more of us are leaving. Family child care, actually, our median age is like 50. There aren't young people coming into this into the field. And family child care, especially in rural areas, is extremely important. Most of our child care deserts are in those rural areas because you don't have enough children to create a um, group center that's going to actually be feasible and be profitable enough to do anything like that. Um, definitely the health insurance, getting us into a state-based or even, you know, universal health care would be great for all small businesses across the board and um, parents and, you know, others. Um, just really working on things that and we're really looking at who we're, um, just like we're, you know, voting for and looking at making sure that we are informed and that we do our homework and you know, reach out to those people and make sure that they really are doing what they say they're going to do and that they really are going to invest in our people in our communities because that is where we need our dollars to go is into our people in our communities and that infrastructure does actually include humans and that is the one last piece that really wasn't um, taken care of with the build back better was that human care economy paid family medical leave all of that and that's what's left so all of us now can coalesce around that and really push for that to get over the finish line so we can create you know an opportunity for everybody to thrive instead of just surviving. Absolutely. And what a wonderful idea to sort of end on. Thank you so much, Kareem. So um, Claudia, yep, if you can bring our slides back up, thank you so much. Uh, so thank you to our panelists, Kareem, Gabriella, and Ariel, as well as our opening speakers, Wendy and Leah. Um, I know that you can't all see the chat, but nevertheless, we love to be seeing your reactions. So if you wanna add anything that you're taking away from today's conversation, that will be really helpful for us. And then we can also share it back out with all of you. Um, I wanted to just close with a couple of things that I'm taking away from this conversation today. So a couple of things. One is we know that improving compensation for early educators is difficult work, but we also know that it can be done. We can learn from those of you on the call today um, who have been making great strides forward in providing wages, um, health insurance, various things to um, improve compensation for early childhood educators. We also know that we can learn from the new strategies that have been tried during the pandemic. So looking to places like North Carolina where they have really worked with programs to address compensation um, using grant money. And I think thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, is really making space for and engaging early educators as activists in their own right. You heard from Kareem today about the power of really engaging educators, and we can all be thinking about the supports that we can offer to help folks like Kareem to tell their stories. So thank you all so much for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more and continue to stay connected to CSCCE, um, you can follow us on social media. You can sign up for our email newsletter. Um, if you go to the next slide, Claudia, we'll also be sharing out the slides with our email so you can get in touch with us directly. Um, and then last slide. In the meantime, you can check out our other resources that can help you on your journey to improve compensation for early educators. So until next time, thank you very much for joining us today and take care.